Thank you so much, Emily and Adrian. Wonderful conversation. And it's now my pleasure to introduce to you our last formal speaker of the symposium before our Q&A panel. So get those questions ready, everybody. Um, Dartmouth's own Jed Dobson, the organizer of today's event, is also going to share with you some thoughts in a, in a talk he's titled Keywords, Concepts, and Modularity, Approaching the College Classroom After MOOCs. Um, I kept looking to, Je to Jed as the, all these talks have been going on saying, this, this is what you're doing, this is great, this is great, <laughs> because I think it's going to be a nice way to bring things together. Let me tell you a little bit about Jed. James E. Dobson is a lecturer and resident scholar in the Department of English here at Dartmouth. He also holds appointments in, are you ready? the Institute for Writing and Rhetoric, Psychological and Brain Sciences, and the MALS program. His essays have appeared in the Mark Twain Annual and Arizona Quarterly and are forthcoming in Legacy and College Literature. In his book project, which is titled, titled The Awkward Age of Autobiography, he examines the partial, repetitive, and nonlinear forms taken by American turn-of-the-century autobiography and the relationship between these formal shifts to questions of histiography within the period. His team taught course, The American Renaissance at Dartmouth College, launches here at Dartmouth X this February. Jed, thank you. I do feel like my talk will echo many things that we've been hearing uh, today. Let's begin the, the classroom. This term I'm teaching two courses here at Dartmouth. One of these is a survey course of both the popular and idiosyncratic methodologies used within the field of American cultural studies. We meet twice a week and spend every session attempting to sort out how one or two critics, depending on the difficulty of the readings, approaches the objects of his or her interest. Once we get a handle on this murky notion of methodology, we think hard about the strengths and weaknesses of the selected and frequently unstated approach. The end goal of this course is to develop a sense of the stakes of any particular methodology and make it possible for the student to understand the limitations involved in the necessary task of participating in an intellectual tradition or school. The second course I'm teaching this term is a first year writing intensive course called Campus Life that takes as its subject the history and cultural representation of college. We read a range of essays and books that give us a sense of the meaning of college, and we look for ways in which these ideas and ideals have been articulated, defended, and questioned within popular culture. We read John Henry Newman, F. Scott Fitzgerald, we read Donna Tartt, and tomorrow night we all head to our campus auditorium to watch a film together. Well, this symposium marks the near opening of registration for an American Renaissance MOOC. For over a year, I have been involved in a cycle of learning, creation and application that has connected my classroom with our work in planning for this online course. As I mentioned in my open remarks, all the speakers assembled here are teachers, and the vast majority of faculty teaching MOOCs are dedicated classroom teachers. We cannot help but connect the various spaces in which our teaching takes place with our research and our participation in our various living and learning communities. I frequently bring material that I'm working on to my students, solicit feedback, and modify my arguments, my evidence, my thinking. Let me give you an example. This week I wrote some material for a small unit to be used in my MOOC based on an in-class exercise using text mining tools to distantly read text collected from the Yik Yak social media application. I used this last week in my Campus Life course. I took the script text to my class for a workshop, received some valuable comments and suggestions, revised the text, which I would read in front of a camera, produced a demonstration using a well-known 19th century text, and filmed it one hour later. A prediction. I would venture to guess that the residential classroom increasingly will be organized around loosely coupled concepts and objects. We can draw inspiration for architecting such classrooms from some digital experiments in pedagogy. Prior to Stanford's introduction to artificial intelligence course, and before the term MOOC was coined, Stephen Downs and George Siemens launched a large-scale online course called Connectivism and Connective Knowledge. Downs and Siemens connected the technological metaphor, the brain as computer, to the very form through which they taught their online course, enabling their online students to build large numbers of links or connections between nodes, which could be sources of information or objects produced by other learners, Downs and Siemens sought to establish the conditions necessary 
for their students to spur each other into learning. Dave Cormier has recently extended this type of connectivist pedagogy by drawing on Deleuze and Guattari to theorize what he calls the collaborative rhizomatic learning experience, in which rather than following a predetermined path through a field or problem, a community of learners constructs its own extensible and reconfigurable knowledge map. Downs and Siemens call this networked learning. It is quite similar to what, in this idea's manifestation, the residential classroom, Andrew Del Banco, has recently termed lateral learning. This, Del Banco writes, is the proposition that students have something important to learn from one another. Lateral learning coupled with objects tends towards discovery. By using the term discovery, I do not intend to reconfigure the classroom around the model of the empirical sciences, but rather to suggest gains in terms of insight, engagement, and wonder. Discovery should prim be primarily associated with learning arised from sustained exploration of objects. These include the traditional classroom materials, our primary text, secondary sources, and other material or physical uh, or even digital objects. I think the biggest change to my teaching in the past few years has been the reorientation of my courses around keywords, concepts, and objects. In my American Studies course, we use a very good collection of essays on the major keywords used within the field. These essays, according to the introduction provided by the editors in this volume, are not dictionaries. They do not fix the meaning of the term. They expose the term as a site of unresolved conflict and contestation. This book, now in its second edition, was popular enough with teachers and students to inspire New York University Press to sponsor an entire series of keyword books. There are now keywords for disability studies, keywords for environmental studies, keywords for children's literature, and keywords for Asian American studies. All of this leads me to ask, why is there such an interest in keywords at the present moment? I think one possible answer can be found in the shift away from using the classroom to provide information to fostering what the president of this institution, Phil Hanlon, calls wisdom. In an address to our faculty on November 2013, shortly before we took the plunge into MOOCs, Hanlon made the following observation about the present economic and educational environment. One clear consequence of the information age is that nobody will pay Dartmouth tuition to get information. Right? Information is now a free and public good. If you want it, go get it on your laptop. The time is hard upon us when knowledge is also going to be a free public good. If you want to learn about Walt Whitman or quantum mechanics or artificial intelligence, you will be able to view lectures by great faculty at Dartmouth and MIT and Stanford. Today we have with us those teaching Walt Whitman online for free. I would hesitate to say, however, that they are just providing information about Whitman. Neither will we, in our course, provide fixed information about Whitman. Regardless, it's apparent that the widespread availability of high-quality information changes our situation within the classroom. I see essay collections and projects like NYU's keywords. And I should note here that there are also websites with user-editable wikis to accompany these texts, our response to the information age. Now, I'm very much in favor of the information age. I do not want to use classroom time to provide information to my students. Not only do I suspect and hope that they would reject or at least be suspicious of any attempt on my part to impart information, but I think this would be a complete waste of our time. Instead, I want to continue design course sessions around a series of modular elements. Modularity, as I understand it, is the design is the design ideal of complex systems that are built on smaller, replaceable, and reconfigurable components. While modular design can result in the bland, prefabricated cookie cutter, think here of the suburban homes or the mangled home, misbuilt IKEA furniture destined for the landfill, can also be used as a weapon against waste, disposability, and planned obsolescence. Modularity enables complexity by clearly defining interfaces. Tab A goes in slot B but it also enables us to preserve our past investments by adapting the residual to the emergent. I borrow the term modular from my previous career in the computer and scientific computing industries. Part of my motivation for entering the humanities was a growing frustration with planned obsolescence. In my graduate program, my doctoral advisor was fond of telling me that what differentiates the humanities from other disciplines is our treatment of the past. We can never say that the past is past. Whether we frame this as an obligation 
a working through, an unfinished project, compulsive repetition, or reparative work, those of us in the humanities have a special relation to the so-called residual. I reject the logic of a disruption that sends the past to the ash heap through a revaluation of the term legacy. As I will argue, modularity in the humanities can mean a generous and porous wisdom making assemblage. Now, MOOCs are modular to the core, but perhaps some courses have not gone far enough. Our MOOC platform, edX, is so completely saturated with modularity that we are never exactly sure what the term module really means on this platform. Well, my description of modularity has thus far focused on the faculty side, the production side. There's an important way in which modularity exists in the everyday use of MOOCs from the learner perspective. If we take what might seem like a challenge to be overcome within the MOOC, the fact that many students are learners, will undertake a course in a nonlinear fashion, or that most sign up without the intention of completing the course as having distinctive pedagogical value. Seen from this perspective, we can design modular elements for <coughs> maximum reuse, remixing, and even misuse. For our American Renaissance course, we have created a series of videos that seek to define key terms. We call them keyword videos, much like those in the essay collections I mentioned earlier. Like these essays, these short videos are not intended to be exhausting definitions, but opening into contested ideas and concepts. We need these modular components, including but hardly limited to videos within the MOOC for several reasons. Producing high quality learning objects is time consuming and expensive. The same with activities, mapping projects, annotation exercises, tools to build timelines, and my previously mentioned distant reading demonstration. Each component of the MOOC should be designed to take into account a learner's desire to disassemble elements and reorder them. This also enables their reuse in the classroom. Individual units of the class are not immutable, but extensible. As an open source software design, learning should be extensible and use high quality tested and pre-existing elements whenever possible. Interfaces between objects, assignments, activities, readings, and lectures should be pluggable in order to facilitate the needs of a particular class objective or configuration. This is to say that we desire the ability to modify our courses midstream in order to make adjustments for contingencies and unexpected events happening outside the classroom. A teacher must be nimble and also able to respond to sudden changes, especially when deploying technology in the classroom. We put our slides on USB drives, a copy in Dropbox, and we also email it to ourselves just in case. We can plan a careful outline for each course session, but it would be pedagogically irresponsible not to respond to the situation of the course itself, to the special composition of students present in the classroom. Everyone who's taught two sections of the same course at the same time knows exactly what I mean. It's an example of modularity. By way of a conclusion, I want to now turn to an unlikely source, Jonathan Z. Smith a figure who, if I have, who I have invoked in my subtitle as a ghostly presence, to provide a corrective for my otherwise enthusiastic embrace of technology, or what many are now calling solutionism. Smith is a famous figure at the University of Chicago. In an interview in 2008 that appeared in his student newspaper, Smith is quoted as saying that he refuses to use a computer and will not use email. He says, and I quote, no, I take Mark, Marx very seriously. I think the computer alienates the worker from his production. I do not understand. With a typewriter, I hit a key and it goes bam. I understand that. I made that letter happen. Now my Smith Corona broke down, so I'm very happy because now I do everything by hand again because then it's mine. My subtitle gestures to the introductory, the introductory essay approaching the college classroom of Smith's recently collected volume of essays titled On Teaching Religion. He is what I would call an untimely figure, maybe an anachronism, and certainly a misfit, all of which is to say I find him incredibly compelling. In this essay, Smith provides a list of his rules for teaching. One, students should gain some sense of mastery. Among other things, this means read less rather than more. In principle, the student should have time to read each assignment twice. Two, always begin with the question of definition and return to it. Three, make arguments explicit, both those found in the readings and those made in class. Four, nothing must stand alone. 
comparison opens space for criticism. Five, a student only knows something well if she can apply it to something else. Six, students have learned something when they can be reflective about their initial understanding. This presumes you have built into the course some means of recording initial understandings. Now, while Smith might enjoy making iron laws, he's also a notorious rule breaker. Famous for continuing to smoke in his office to this day, Smith, I think, might appreciate my selective appropriation of his rules. For example, I have little truck with mastery and much prefer a term like fluency. I also like to overwhelm everyone, us, my students, and myself with readings. <laughs> so what does this cranky New Testament scholar have to do with the future of teaching and learning? I think that reflection is something we do especially well on MOOCs and something we can do a whole lot more of in the classroom. I also think that Smith understands the notion of modularity. The humanities have always been modular. We deal with arguments. We establish very real and serious stakes between oppositional positions by not allowing anything to stand alone. In other words, to be reduced to information, Smith's notion of comparison produces tensions. I think the key in introducing my pluggable modular elements into a residential course will be the finding of ways to make these sticky. They should be disconnectable, but easily coupled, perhaps even magnetic. They should be incomplete objects that make demands on subjects for comparison with other objects. As many of my colleagues now know, I'm rather fond of Max Weber. So fun as a matter of fact that I frequently assign his science as a vocation essay lecture as the final course reading in several classes. I do primarily because I want to use the final course reading as an opportunity to talk about my own teaching and my pedagogical commitments. In this lecture, Weber argues that, quote, the primary task of a useful teacher is to teach his students to recognize inconvenient facts. I mean facts that are inconvenient for their party opinions. Teaching for Weber involves the presentation of irreconcilable conflicts to students. Each element, each component, a lecture, an interview, a primary or secondary reading, everything in a modular pedagogy must exist in relation to other objects. Ending with Weber enables some sense of transparency and restores a sense of order to what has appeared as a rather disordered syllabus. From this vantage point, my alternating embrace of divergent oppositional readings looks less like early onset professional confusion than a distinct pedagogical strategy. Thank you.